So we're going to look at uh, Luke 24, starting in verse 13 here in a moment. And it's the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus. These guys actually spent more time with Jesus than anybody else on that first Resurrection Sunday. They're on a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Jesus will give them one of the great, well, probably the greatest Bible study of all time as he joins up with them. They are oblivious to who it is, who he is. And so this is an amazing narrative. Uh, as you know, that first Sunday morning, it says Mary Magdalene went to the tomb first while it was still dark. She found the stone rolled away. And she, you know, freaking out, what's going on here? She runs back and tells the disciples, the apostles. Uh, Peter and John run back to the tomb. They find it empty, but they don't know what's going on. Nobody understood what was happening. Mary goes back to the tomb, and she thinks somebody stole the body. And so she's asking the angel, there's two angels in the tomb, and he said, why are you looking for Jesus? You know, among the dead, he is risen, he's not here. And she still didn't know. She thought somebody had taken the body. That's what they all assumed at this point. And so we pick up in chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel, if you have your Bibles, and we'll start in verse 13. And so as the people are leaving Jerusalem, you know, they were there for Passover. Jesus dies on Passover that Friday. He's put in the tomb. And now everybody's starting to leave. Families in Jerusalem and head back. Usually there's about 200,000 people in Jerusalem on Passover or Pentecost and Feast of Tabernacles. The required feasts would be up to two and a half, three million people in Jerusalem. So it was packed. So when it's over, people start to leave. And so these two men are walking from Jerusalem, very discouraged, very downcast. Uh, these two men are not apostles, they are disciples. One of them is nameless, we don't know who he is. The other one, his name is Cleopas. We don't know anything else about him. But I think the Lord intended this on purpose, that these guys, even though they're nothing special, they're just like us, ordinary disciples. But if you're saved this morning, then you have experienced an equally important experience with Jesus Christ, the risen Lord and Savior. You've had that extraordinary encounter with him, just like these guys encountered the Lord. So let's pick up in verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So I can imagine they were just confused, they were devastated, they're hopeless, they're despairing. This conversation was probably, you know, just a down and out kind of a conversation. These guys had witnessed Jesus doing so many amazing things. They were disciples, they followed him. They would have probably seen him heal the sick, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. They may have been at the tomb of Lazarus when he raised Lazarus from the dead. They may have been there when he fed the multitudes with the little boy's lunch. They definitely were there when Jesus is riding on the donkey. Last Sunday, we talked about Palm Sunday. He comes on the donkey, fulfilling prophecy. All the people are hailing him as the king of the Jews. They're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. And then they would have watched him overthrow the money changers tables on the temple mount. And he drives them off the Temple Mount. Jesus was upset. He says, you have turned my father's house of prayer into a den of thieves. Because they were ripping the people off. They were religious hucksters. But then everything crashed and burned as Jesus got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he's beaten. And then he gets mocked, spit upon. He is, uh, you know whipped, scourged. It was a cat of nine tails. They would have just shredded him with the cat of nine tails. Then they nail him to a Roman cross, and these disciples are thinking, what went wrong? What happened to our Messiah Jesus? We were hoping he was the Savior. And so as these two guys are leaving Jerusalem, they're probably thinking that Mary Magdalene and the other women were crazy because they came back and told these guys, we've seen the risen Lord, and they did not believe them. So in verse 15, it says, So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. 
Now, the scene becomes even more amazing because, first of all, when it says they conversed and reasoned among themselves, it means they're emphatically talking about what happened. You know, what went wrong? You know, they're probably very animated. Maybe we were wrong to follow this Jesus. What's our family going to say now? We left everything to follow him. Could we have been so wrong about him? Now what are we going to do? So while they're talking, Jesus just draws near to them, and he just follows alongside of them, and they don't even recognize this is Jesus. Verse 16, But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. I wonder how long Jesus just listened to them as they tried to figure it all out. But again, their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. We know that after the resurrection, when Mary Magdalene first sees Jesus, she didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener. And it wasn't until he spoke her name and said, Mary, that she said, Rabboni, teacher. That's when she knew this is Jesus. She didn't understand and recognize, believe until he spoke her name. Like Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So, this is how he will reveal himself, and it's interesting that their eyes were restrained. In other words, the way in which Jesus reveals himself to them, we'll see that it's the same way he has revealed himself to us and to millions of people over the last 2,000 years. It's through the scriptures. He's going to take them back to the scriptures, and that's how they're going to recognize who he is. This is evidence of Romans 10, verse 17, where it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We'll get into that in a little bit. But after walking with these two downcast and discouraged disciples for a while, verse 17 says, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this? that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. As I've mentioned many times over the years, Jesus does not ask questions because he doesn't know the answer. He's the risen Lord and Savior. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows what they're talking about. But anytime Jesus asks a question of someone, it's because he's trying to get them to draw out, drawing out from their heart what's going on in their life. What are they really feeling? What are they really struggling with? He wants to know because he can minister to our deepest hurts. He alone can do and minister to the struggles that we're going through. So it says in verse 20, um, verse 18, Then one of those whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened here in these days? I mean, this is kind of funny, actually, because he's saying, are you the only stranger? It literally means, are you the only foreigner? He's thinking, what's wrong with you, man? Come on, man. Are you from Mars or something? You're the only person that's leaving Jerusalem that doesn't even know what's going on? So Jesus just kind of plays along with them. Again, these two guys are just regular, normal disciples, and this narrative should speak to all of us because, after all, we're living in crazy times. We've had two years of COVID chaos, now with Russia plowing through the Ukraine, inflation hitting an all-time high. The very fabric of our society is unraveling before our very eyes. And like these two men, a lot of people today are living in despair. They're living in hopelessness. They're in confusion. There's fear. They're thinking, what's happening? Now again, Jesus will ask them another question to draw them out. Verse 19, And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. I mean, these guys are getting frustrated with Jesus at this point. You mean what things? What are you talking about? The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. He was a mighty prophet in deed and word. God used him to minister to all the people, but the religious leaders condemned him to death. They crucified him. Again, they must be thinking, what's wrong with this guy? Did he just crawl out of a cave? 
Crawl out from under a rock? Well, close. <laughs> he just came out from a tomb. It was a sealed tomb. So verse 21, but we were hoping. Verse 21, but we, Cleopas and his friend, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. This verse really shows us how down and discouraged these guys were. We were hoping he was the one. We were hoping he was going to redeem Israel. But now all of our hope is gone. This shows us that their hope and their trust in Jesus was misplaced. Why? Because they were hoping he was going to be a political deliverer and set them free from the Roman Empire. But he came for a much bigger purpose to redeem us from the worst enemy of all, which is sin. He came to die on the cross, shed his blood, so that our sins could be forgiven. And the way he would do that is exactly what Cleopas and his friend are telling Jesus. Yeah, the chief priest condemned him to death, and he was crucified. I can just picture Jesus thinking, oh, wow, what else did that Jesus guy do? What else happened to this person named Jesus of Nazareth? And they're like, well, it's the third day since he was crucified. And besides that, verse 22, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they said they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Again, when the women saw the risen Jesus, they ran and told the disciples. The apostles didn't believe him. Peter and John ran. They didn't see him. And so Cleopas says that certain men who were among us, they didn't see him. Now, if I was Jesus, I would be getting, I don't know, maybe sarcastic. You know, the apostles didn't see him, huh? But the women did. They said he's alive? Huh, I wonder if the third day has any significance in all this. I wonder if there's any real meaning behind that. Well, verse 25, Jesus will now speak up. They still don't know it's him, but then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, this is truly amazing. First of all, Jesus has been patient with these guys. He's been listening to everything that they're telling him. They've been grumbling, they're complaining, they're discouraged. He's listening to them as they dump all their burdens and fears and confusion upon him. He listens to them just like he listens to us when we're going through hard times, when we're struggling with whatever's happening in our lives. Our world is collapsing all around us. We're dealing with real pain and problems and issues today. But the Lord cares. He's listening and like these guys, I'm sure we've all had our times of fear and f confusion, frustration. Why is this happening, Lord? I don't know what's going on. Where are you in all this? But Jesus is just quietly listening to everything that we're pouring out to him. He knows exactly what we're going through. He knows exactly what we need. And he knows exactly what he's going to do. That's why we need to trust him and grow in our faith, and believe he's got it all in complete control. So when Jesus says to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, he's letting them know that all their anxiety and their discouragement to their frustration could have been avoided if they would have simply believed the Scriptures if they simply would have believed the word of God. Jesus says, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, not only had Jesus been telling his disciples exactly what was going to happen when he got to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be you know, put on a false trial, I'm going to be beaten, 
crucified, but I'm going to rise again the third day. We've already seen in Matthew, he said that three times to them leading up to this scenario. But Jesus also tells them all that these things were prophesied about in the Old Testament. How does Jesus show them these things are true and valid? He takes them through the scriptures. He says he begins with Moses. What's that mean? Well, the first five books of your Bible, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Starting in the book of Genesis, he explains to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Here's an example, Genesis 3.15. This is the first prophecy concerning the virgin birth, but also how Jesus will defeat the serpent, Satan, at the cross. God says to Satan, after you know he's condemning Satan for deceiving Adam and Eve, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. That's a reference to the virgin birth. The woman doesn't have the seed, the man does. And so this is a reference to the virgin birth. He, speaking of the Messiah, shall bruise your head, serpent, Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. I'm sure Jesus explained how he was going to be the one who fulfills this. Plus about 300 more prophecies concerning his first coming 2,000 years ago. For example, the entire sacrificial system that God established through Moses, it all pointed to Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everything in the tabernacle and later in the temple, it all refers to Jesus. He is the show, table of showbread. He's the bread of life. The menorah in the temple, the tabernacle. Jesus is the light of the world. I mean, it all pointed to him, one reference after another. Then there were all the prophets who told of the miracles, the signs and wonders that he would do when the Messiah shows up. You know, opening blind eyes and opening deaf ears, doing all that thing that he did. He did everything exactly as the prophets predicted. I'm sure Jesus gave these two guys an amazing Bible study as he speaks about the suffering Savior. And he would have gone through Psalm 22. It talks about his hands and his feet would be pierced. Well, that was written 700 years before crucifixion was even developed. Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. Isaiah 53, he's the lamb of God that was led to slaughter. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what happened at the cross. He probably told them about Abraham. Abraham took his son, his only son, Isaac, up on Mount Moriah, which is very close to where Jesus was crucified, and he was to sacrifice his son Isaac, and he's getting ready to bring the knife down, and the angel says, no, stop. And then God provided a, a sheep, a ram in the thicket, and he offered that up. It was a picture of what Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, would go through. He probably taught them the meaning of Passover, where they would take the blood of the lamb when they're still in Egypt, the final plague. They'd put the blood on the lintel and the doorposts of their home. When the death angel passed over and saw the blood, then they were spared in the home. Jesus is our Passover lamb. If he's in your life, you're covered by the blood of the lamb. You will not die as other people will die. We will die physically, but we instantly go to be with the Lord. Jesus would have expounded from the Old Testament you know, references of the resurrection. And he uses the interesting scene of Jonah and the whale. Jesus believed a whale story. Hopefully you do too. But he talked about the whale as a sign of his own burial and resurrection. Remember what Jesus said. This is Matthew 12, starting in verse 39, when the Pharisees were demanding, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the, heart, uh, the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The implication being just as Jonah was regurgitated on the beach from the belly of the whale, after three days Jesus would be resurrected from the heart of the earth, the tomb, after three days. I'm sure Jesus told him about King David's prophecy. Psalm 16, verse 10, 
David writes, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, the place of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. That's a reference to the Messiah. The Holy One would not see corruption. He would not deteriorate in a tomb. He would conquer the grave. That's a prophecy Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 Jews get saved because they now believe Jesus did die. He was crucified for our sins. He rose from the dead, and they got saved. Jesus, taking these guys through the scriptures, I mean, that's a Bible study I would love to be part of. The Word of God Himself, Jesus, teaching them the Word of God, about the Word of God Himself. What a Bible study that was. Now, it's interesting that the world today calls you and me, who are followers of Christ, foolish for believing the Scriptures. Jesus says, no, you who do not believe the Scriptures are foolish. That's what He's telling these disciples. Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. God's Word, our Bibles, are different than any other source that human beings can come up with. God's Word tells us how the universe came into being. This tells us how man and woman were created by God. This tells us why the world is in such a mess today because of sin. This book tells us why we need a Savior. It also tells us that we're all sinners who need a Savior. None are righteous. No, not one. This also tells us that we, all that we need to know about our human nature, that Jesus alone paid the price that we can never pay. This book alone tells us what will happen in the last days and why people need to get saved because judgment is coming. God is going to bring His judgment, His wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. And so the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, period, is the living, powerful Word of the Lord to us, His people to the people of this world. This has the answers to all of life's most important questions. You know, who am I? Where did I come from? What happens when I die? Where will I go when I die? This Bible has the answers. Is there life after death? If there's a heaven, how do I get there? If there is a God, why would He create a place like hell? Again, God's Word has the answers. We also know from the Bible that Satan is alive and well, and he's doing all he can to try to get people to doubt God's Word, ignore God's Word, twist God's Word. He did it at the very beginning with Adam and Eve when he said, he questioned God. Did God really say, trying to get them to think, well, yeah, I'm not sure. How did he say that again? And Satan lied to them. Jesus says, in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. You know, God's word is very clear. What will happen to Satan in the future? He and all the demons and all who follow them will be cast alive into the lake of fire that burns forever. And so don't be foolish and believe all the lives of Satan. Believe all the theories of fallen man, but be a fool for Christ. Be sold out to Jesus because we believe in Christ and we believe in God the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit. He inspired every jot and tittle of the Word of God. Again, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And as a result of Jesus explaining these scriptures to these two men, we're going to see how their eyes will be opened. And they will know that's Jesus. And it's through the Word of God. That's what God's Word does within our hearts also. As we open up the Word, the Holy Spirit of God will begin to take God's Word. He'll breathe life into His Word. He breathes life into us. We begin to hear His words of comfort and encouragement and strength and truth. We realize that the truth that Jesus is with us always. We understand the truth that He'll never leave us or forsake us. This is why God's Word is so powerful and amazing. He can, He will speak directly to you, to anything you're going through, because His Word is life. His Word brings hope. His Word corrects us. It instructs us. And above all, His Word opens up our eyes to see Jesus more clearly. So notice in verse 28, 
Then they drew near to the village. They're almost to Emmaus, where they were going. And he indicated, Jesus, that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Again, there are some wonderful things taking place here. They're finishing their seven-mile journey. And Jesus acts like, I'm going to keep walking. I'm just going to keep on going. But these two guys, it says they constrained him. That means they literally grabbed him and they said, you're not going anywhere. You're coming in the house with us. We need to hear more of what you're talking about. We need you to abide with us is what they say. Now, this is important because if these guys would have said to Jesus, hey, it was nice talking to you. We'll see you later. And they start to turn and go into the house like, oh, man, let's lock the door and get rid of this weirdo. If they would have done that, Jesus would have kept going. He's not going to stick around where he's not wanted. He's not going to stay where he's not appreciated. That's not what happened, though, is Jesus has been expounding the word of God to them. A fire has been kindled in their hearts, and they're starting to understand more and more of what God's word was saying about the Messiah, about his death, his burial, his resurrection. So that's why they say, not so fast, mister. We want to hear more from you. When they say to Jesus, abide with us, it's late, the day is far spent. That's just the invitation Jesus needed to hear. He was just waiting for that. He's not going to force his way into your life, but you need to invite him into your life. John, 1, you know, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. The word abide means to dwell. It means to be at home with. In other words, Jesus wants to be at home in your home, at home in your heart. Jesus tells us in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So the big question is, have you invited Jesus to dwell and abide in your home, in your heart? Revelation 3.20 is where Jesus tells that church who, you know, he's on the outside. They didn't want him abiding. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So when Cleopas invites Jesus to come inside his home, it says that Jesus went inside and stayed with them. This is important for all of us to do as believers, especially when we see so much chaos going all around us in this world. Get alone with Jesus. Let Him minister to your heart. Turn off the TV. Turn off the radio. Turn off your internet. Turn off your computer. Turn off your watch. I get around people all the time, and every five seconds, beep, beep. Oh, okay. It's like, Turn it off. Get alone with the Lord. Get away from all the distractions you have around you and just open up the Bible, the Word of God, and let Jesus rekindle the fire within your heart and soul. And like these two guys, ask the Lord to stay for a while. I mean, He's in us. He's with us. But ask the Lord, constrain Him to speak to you from the Scriptures, and He will. Verse 30, it says, Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. I mean, this is interesting, because Jesus is taking the role of the host within this home. That was the, the owner of the house to do that. He takes the bread, he breaks it after he blesses it, then he hands it to them, and they take the bread from him, and notice what happens. Verse 31 then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Whoa. All of a sudden, their eyes are opened. They knew him. They realized this is Jesus. It doesn't tell us how they knew it was Jesus. Was it the prayer he prayed? We don't know. Was it when he handed them the bread, they saw the nail-pierced you know, hands? 
It doesn't tell us. We don't know for sure, but immediately they recognize him, and then immediately it says he disappears. He just vanished from their sight. He'll show up later that evening, and these guys will be there when he shows up because they're going to run back home to Jerusalem, or run back to Jerusalem in a hurry. But look at verse 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? If you want to know Jesus or if you want to know him better, if you want that fire in your heart to burn even brighter and burn even hotter, this verse is the key. Notice what they said. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road? In other words, it wasn't when they were talking to him, but it was when he was talking to them. It wasn't when they were thinking, well, this guy's a weirdo. He didn't even know what happened here. No, it's when Jesus talked to them. The second part of this verse says their hearts were opened while he opened the scriptures to us. In other words, not only does Jesus wait patiently as we pour out our problems and we pour out our pains and our struggles to him, but Jesus also wants us to learn how to sit patiently and listen intently as he begins to share with us from his word. That's why the Bible is so important. This is the only book that claims to be the written word of God given to us. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the division of the soul and the spirit. This is what God's Word can do. That is when the fire will be kindled or rekindled within you and me. Jeremiah the prophet certainly understood this. He knew about the fire of God's Word. The Word of God is mentioned more times in the book of Jeremiah than any other book. In fact, Jeremiah was very discouraged because every time he'd share the word of the Lord, nobody wanted to listen. Everybody was getting upset with him. He gets thrown into a dungeon. He gets to a point where he says, God's word was like a burning fire within my heart and I could not hold it back any longer. That's after he said, I'm not going to tell anybody about your word anymore, God. And then Jeremiah 23, 9 on the screen, God says, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord? And like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. That's the power of God's word. Now, with their eyes opened up to the fact that Jesus is alive, he is risen from the dead, and with their hearts ablaze with the living hope of Jesus, they head back to Jerusalem. Verse 33 says, So they rose up that very hour. So as soon as Jesus disappears, they're like, Oh, that was Jesus we got to go and tell somebody. So they run back. They wrote, returned that very hour to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And, when, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And I can guarantee that they covered those seven miles a lot faster <laughs> than when they left Jerusalem heading back to Emmaus. That makes sense because now their hearts are bursting with excitement. Now they've got meaning and purpose in their life once again. Now they can testify, Jesus is alive. The Lord is risen indeed. And even he even appeared to Peter. So make no mistake about it. The resurrection of Jesus is the most important event in human history. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then the Apostle Paul says your faith is worthless. Of all people, we are most to be pitied because if he stayed dead in the tomb, if he did not rise up from the grave, then Jesus is no different than any other religious leader that made a lot of claims and promises. But because Jesus did rise from the grave, he alone can forgive us of all of our sins. He alone can give us eternal life. He alone can minister to us right now. He alone can come into your life if you've never received him as your Lord and Savior. And he can minister to you no matter what you may have gone through in the past, whatever you're going through now, whatever you're going to face tomorrow, with Jesus in your life, you know that he will be with you to either take you out of that problem or to see you through that problem. 
but he is with you because he loves you and he'll be with you both now and forevermore. And that's something you'll never find in religion. It's all about a relationship. And that's what Jesus establishes with you and me, a relationship where we can walk hand in hand with the risen Lord and Savior. I'll close with this verse from Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. This is how Peter describes this many years later. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again, or caused us to be born again, notice, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we have a living hope. It's not a wishful thinking, well, I hope it's true. Well, I hope there's a heaven. Well, I hope I make it. No, a living hope means it's a sure thing. And he says it's a sure thing because the living hope is based on the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the resurrection of Christ, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, speaking of your place reserved for you in heaven, he says, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. He'll keep you safe and secure because you're in his hands. Doesn't mean you're not going to face hardships and trials, but he's with you always, even to the end of this age. But it's through the power of God, through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So it's reserved in heaven for you. Have you made your reservation? <laughs> or more accurately, have you confirmed your reservation for heaven? I know where I'm going when I die. The Bible is very clear that these things were written that we may know that we have eternal life. We know where we're going when we die, not based on anything I do, but based on what Jesus Christ has done. And you can have that confirmation of your reservation and glory by just simply coming to Christ, asking Him into your life, allowing Him to wash your heart clean. His blood was shed so that you could be forgiven. And He would turn you into a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And that's why we can celebrate this Resurrection Sunday morning because we have new life, abundant life, living life, not just going through the motions of life, but we have an assured life, an eternal life waiting, waiting for us in glory. No.